Welcome to Team More Wine, sir. The Game of Thrones guerrilla cast for Boomtron's Optionated. I'm Elena. With me is Rachel. And we're here today to talk about the latest episode. So crack open a bottle like we just did. And sit back and listen in while we ramble and curse our way through a dissection of the episode. Episode 7, A Man Without Honor. Actually, before we get into this, I want to go back to one very minor thing from last week about Jock and Hagar and his reference to the Red God and how the Red God must be paid. Yeah. You made a comment uh, that basically that I shouldn't take Jock and Hagar to be a representative of the lore. Here's yeah. the thing. I didn't actually make an, an association between Jacques and Hagar saying anything about a red god and Relor. I thought it was his own god, like he just oh. worshipped the red god of death, and that like was his own weird little religion. Okay. So I just want to, yeah. I, the only reason I brought that up is because I didn't, because Melisandra is is Relor and the red god, and that's why she's all red. And you know, they they're not working for the. Same guy. It's not like Jock and Hagar and Mel- Melisandre are the same, you know, team. Right. Yeah, w- worth pointing out, but I actually didn't even make that connection because I forgot Melisandre had called her god the red god. Mm-hmm. I figured it was like, you know, the god of blood, that that kind of red god. Right, right. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. I think it's just because Jock and, um is, is from across the sea, same mm-hmm. place that Melisandre is from, so... He's more familiar with R'hllor than, say, someone in Westeros. So he's he's not a follower of the Seven. Mm-hmm. Like they're they're a foreign god to him. The, the Seven are. Okay. Well, I'm glad we cleared that up. Now, Episode Seven. Gosh, uh, you <laughs> pick, you you pick the place you want to start with this one because there's so many places to go. Oh gosh. Um, okay. Do you want to start with? Um, well, I guess we could get Danny out of the way just because that that was just such a I don't even know what's happening anymore, Elena. I don't know what's happening. Well, I didn't know what was happening to begin with. So <laughs> take that. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, no, that was pretty. That was pretty awesome. Uh, what was it? What's his name? Prius Pre, the Hi charlatan. Pre. Yeah, Hip. yeah, the charlatan turns out not to be such a charlatan if his little shadow reflections can kill some motherfuckers. That was awesome. Yeah, I have. I saw I was at the bar watching it this time around and every I think it was like half of the people watching were like cool and then half the people watching we were all looking at each other like what the fuck is going on? <laughs> the very obvious show watchers book readers. Yeah, show yeah, watchers, you can definitely tell readers. um especially well, well some other things that we'll get to you can tell the book readers because they were cheering at certain lines that everybody else was like why why is that so hilarious? <laughs> It's kind of kind of like last week. So let me send word to my bastard at Dreadfort. And oh course, yes. I'm like, well, that sounds interesting, but is it worth cheering for? And you know, yes. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. I don't. I don't know what. Pi- I, I have no idea what's happening. Like honestly, this is just a continuation of last week, where I'm just. I have kind of an idea of what what's gonna end up happening, mm-hmm. but uh, HBO could just you know tell me to go to hell and totally change everything at this point because they're changing so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I have no clue. I'm just kind of like, I don't, okay. So Pyat pre-killed all the 13 and, and um, Daxos is the king of Karth now. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'll take it. Here's what's funny about my reaction to that episode was that the the ending of that sequence with them, where suddenly you have the shadow slitting twelve throats all at once, and that was pretty badass. I gotta be honest, that mm-hmm. tandem kill like that. Yeah, no, it was really cool looking. <laughs> I felt like that would have made a much stronger episode ending point than the one they chose. And I know that they're trying to mix it up and not like Danny's the only one who gets cliffhangers, and they ended with her last week. So okay, right. fine. But I, I I felt like that actually would have been slightly more compelling end point if the episodes are supposed to end on a oh my god what the fuck moment but that you, was just me. you felt that that was more oh my god what the fuck than than theon uh presenting the bodies to mr lewin yes yes but only only because i have a very strong bias about well a theory bias about those not actually being bran and rickon mm-hmm. for, i as i have four words 
no dire wolves burned bodies. Like they, there's no way that all of Theon's men come back without it, the dire wolves at least savaging one of them if they're trying to kill, you know, Bran and Rickon. That just doesn't happen. The wolves are too big to not get some of them, and they would have to kill the wolves and then present the wolf bodies. They didn't. And the fact that they burned them after so much has kind of been made of we put the heads of traitors on spikes so that everyone can see their faces and verify that, yes, that is, in fact, Ned Stark, the Hand of the King. I, I met him once in court. That's what he looked like. That's right. his head. Mm-hmm. The fact that he burned them beyond recognition says and, and had sent Master Lewin, the only kind of reliable witness for everyone at Winterfell, away, says that he – it didn't find them and he knew he wasn't going to. Right. And, and I don't think that that's necessarily so hard to figure out if you stop no. and think about it, that it actually made a compelling sort of break in, in the story. Yeah. So. Because Theon's been sort of sliding uh, ever farther away from any kind of legitimacy. Right. And he did send, send Maester Lewin away. The dogs had lost the scent. It's not, it's definitely not like a crazy thing for somebody to come off of that episode and say, okay, well, I don't think that that's Bran, and I don't think that that's Rickon. Yeah. Yeah, I'm totally with you. So, I mean, I, I could be wrong, uh, and if I'm wrong, that'll be a big what-the-fuck moment. But, you know, having that be the break and the way it's presented, I don't believe it. And so it was a, a less strong breaking point if if the point is a big kind of, you know, blow-your-mind moment. Right, but we know happens. that they really, really like to end with killing children, right? That's their thing. So. and. That is their thing with kid- kidnapping children or killing them. So yeah, kidnapping or killing or falling from windows. That if there's a child death, then that's going to be the last scene in the episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so yeah, but uh, I mean, we can move on from Danny just because there's really no way for me to talk to you about it without just kind of getting into that whole like, well, in the books, this is what happens and <laughs> I'm mad about it and this doesn't make any sense and blah, 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 blah. But the one thing I do want to address before we move on from Danny totally is that a lot of the people that I know that have read the books are really dissatisfied with Danny right now with mm-hmm. the way that the show is portraying her, mostly because she seems so utterly like whiny and pathetic mm-hmm. and just like not – I don't want to say not strong because it's not as it, I don't want to make it a gender thing, you know, and that's too easy to go in that direction. But, and I understand why people are saying that because she is sort of just wandering around demanding things and kind of whining and getting mad and doing Targaryen eye at everybody. Mm-hmm. But I think it's really, really important to remember that George Martin addresses the idea that one, not all heroic journeys are, you know, Lord of the Rings level wandering around the map kind of journeys. Right. This th- She has nothing, and it's absolutely, totally implausible to think that she's just going to be given everything that she needs in order to go to Westeros immediately and start a war. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's trying to be realistic with that, and there are not enough fantasy. Uh, there are, and they do exist, but not enough of them uh, really examine the way that politics work in a realistic way right in fantasy series and that's what he's doing with danny and i get that people are kind of mad that she's being extra whiny because she is a little bit more regal and and respectable in the book since she hasn't been in the show but i'm actually not mad about it at all uh i'm confused as to what exactly they're going to be doing in karth but i understand the changes that they've made because a t you know TV's a TV show sucks if it's people sitting around in chairs doing nothing but talking to each other unless it's Downton Abbey. <laughs> right. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't work for a show that should have action at least. Right. It's like time. boobs and death and and sex and then uh, and killing and, children. Right. And then, and then just, Danny's sitting in a room. <laughs> right. Be, being you know f- f- fading everybody that comes in. Right. You know, well, I actually find that interesting that that's the the reaction that some viewers are having because I felt like this episode was kind of a move forward for her in terms of maturity. Like she has that great speech to Sergiora where she's basically saying, 
it's, it's finally, I guess, kind of sunk in what some of the people around her have been saying. Like, what do you expect, princess, that we're going to give you a ship or that you're going to go back to Westeros and everyone's waiting there for you with open arms? It's just like, that was what my brother believed. And I've right. kind of had time to think about it. And my brother was a fucking fool. Yeah. And so she's b- maybe being a little bit still like maybe over cynical with her cynicism and I'm not going to trust anybody. But I I think that's kind of the path that you have to take to becoming a a proper leader is at first you're a little bit naive and you trust too much and then you get burned and then you kind of come back to realizing, okay, I have to trust some people. I cannot do everything alone. I just have to be very careful whom I choose to trust. And so I, I think this was a step forward for her in that kind of progression. And it goes back to what you had said about her arc this season is that she's kind of learning statesmanship and even Mm -hmm. if they're taking it in a different way than the book did she is still learning that she's going through that process of how to deal with strangers and how to kind of decide who is worth trusting and who is not yeah and she is and she's not like doxos right because Mm -hmm. he's saying that he came with nothing uh and that he used any means necessary to gain power and for Danny, at least at this point, she she doesn't want to kill people to get power, right? She doesn't right. want to, to steal and connive. She wants to come by it honestly. So she does have morals and she has standards. Mm-hmm. And it, it's just a harder, slower road the way that she's going. Right. Well, just as, as one kind of final conspiracy piece, <laughs> the fact that Daria is missing was yeah. interesting. Danny's presuming her dead. Eerie is dead on the floor, and she obviously, I mean, Danny makes a point to say she died for their, she died for them. She died trying to protect my dragons. Mm-hmm. And what I wondered about this, Doria was a slave girl, and she had been obviously taken by the Dothraki at some point. What proof do we have that she was actually loyal to any of them, or it, that she simply perceived Danny as the best of her options, as yeah. in Danny would protect her and keep her alive and fed and not abuse her, so Danny was a good person to be with. But we don't. I actually kind of wondered if there might be some shenanigan with Doria, where she actually betrayed Danny or let them in or something like that. I mean, Eri, you know, was going to be loyal to her because Eri was Dothraki and she still believed that Khaleesi, that uh, Danny was her Khaleesi, her, right. you know, kind of whatever the female equivalent of Blood Rider is. Like, she was sworn to be with her and to protect her and to be her handmaiden, and that was the point of her life. And that was a much more powerful loyalty than, I guess, the the loyalty of opportunism that I think Daria might have had. Mm-hmm. So I'll be curious to see what comes of that storyline, whether she winds up, you know, dead in a ditch somewhere or if maybe she had a hand in it. Yeah, and I I totally agree with you. One, because Doria is dead in the books at this point. Mm -hmm. So she's kind of a wild, uh, you know, who knows what she's going to, what she's there for. Um, She was actually purchased by Viserys to teach Danny how to please Khal Drogo. Mm -hmm. But whether, but, you know, that doesn't matter. She's still a slave. um, And she was still abused by everyone around her. And you're right. They, a couple episodes ago, her and Eerie had a little spat and Doria was very interested in what Karth had to offer right, uh, for Danny and also maybe for herself. And she was a little kind of bossy. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yeah, I, I think that there's something, something there that maybe she was the person that opened the door and let them in maybe. Yeah. I mean, it's it's at least, you know, worth keeping in the back of your mind as that story progresses. Uh, but that, that was really about all I had with Danny. So, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we can we we covered Theon. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to to say about uh, Bran and Rickon and Hodor? And well, I kind of said my piece about you know not thinking that they're dead. They're still wandering the countryside somewhere. Mm-hmm. I <coughs> sorry. Uh, with as, as far as Theon goes. Man, shit is spiraling out of control for him. Like he, he's. I feel like he's kind of getting a taste of of power, and he seems to be enjoying being able to inflict cruelty on people. Yeah. So maybe in that sense, he is very much his his family's son, which is it's interesting to for that dynamic to be coming out. That even though he was raised completely differently, you know, he was raised by very moral people and um, all that. He is now kind of showing his true colors or whatever. He likes 
kicking people and stomping their heads in and you know yeah. seems to have enjoy inflicting the pain of yes i burned your two last remaining winterfell heirs suck up suck my dick bitches like he's obviously been <laughs> he's obviously been reading some machiavelli because i mean that line was straight you know straight out of machiavelli yeah uh, the, it's, it's better, better to be cruel he, than weak or right which is it's better to be um feared than loved if you cannot be both is the mm-hmm. machiavelli line but i think <laughs> Theon is just, he has no idea how to inspire loyalty, which is, mm-hmm. is weird. I think that's the difference between him and Asha. Asha may may be cruel. That's, that's a fair assessment of her. But she also is is probably fair and just according mm-hmm. to the rules of the Greyjoys, right? Right. Uh, she inspires loyalty in her men. She doesn't necessarily command it without proving why. Mm-hmm. Theon doesn't really know that. He just thinks, oh, okay, I'll just beat people up and they'll fear me and then I will have their loyalty. And it's like he learned nothing by watching Ned kind of inspire loyalty through adherence to rules, basically, right? Like, right. He doesn't get it. For Theon, there are no rules. The only rule is that he is alone. And I think that's one of the themes of the novels in general is people who find themselves in these leadership roles, whether they're kings or queens or generals or whatever they're very alone and it's how they deal with that loneliness and whether or not they trust other people mm-hmm. that sort of moves the plot itself mm-hmm. Theon just sucks at it <laughs> yeah, well i mean yeah he's he sucks in a lot of ways but I, I think that i think that's a good way to put it that he he doesn't understand that there has to be kind of a method to it he's another one like joffrey who didn't really understand the lesson that um, good King Ares presented, mm-hmm. which was you can be cruel, but you have to be. There has to be a method to the madness. If you're just sort of, if it's cruelty of expedience, and no one can really predict how you're going to react and who you're going to kill for disobedience or, you know, for failing and who you're not, they can't trust you. And that's the thing is, I guess the point is, his men don't. They can't trust him yet, and he doesn't trust them. And I don't, I mean, I've said before, I don't think things are going to end well for him, you know, yeah. one way or another. The but. sad part is that, you know, where Joffrey is kind of a psychopath, mm-hmm. he, I don't think Theon is. I think right. Theon understands that what he's doing isn't working, that some things that he does are wrong. You know, it, he was raised by the Starks. He can't be totally immune to mm-hmm. it. They would have done something had he been as dangerous as Joffrey. Right. They, uh, you know, it would have been known. It wouldn't have been like John and Rob would have been allowed to grow up with him. Right. Uh, so I feel ba- more, you know, badly for Theon because he's going to be able to recognize his own downfall. Whereas Joffrey, you know, he's just one of those guys that does what he does because he enjoys it. Yeah. Yeah. Joffrey is not going to understand why he's being killed at the end. I think Theon is going to understand whoever, whoever, whoever's hand it is that holds the axe. He's going to understand why it's coming and yeah. why they're the one holding it. Yeah. Uh, so, so speaking of the of the Lannisters, it's funny that uh, we can go to Jamie now. Yes. That he inspires such loyalty in people that don't even know him. Mm-hmm. That whole that monologue between well mostly Jamie and and the random Lannister cousin it's like he's worshiping the family and that makes sense because we've had Tywin talking about the legacy and the family and the, you know over and over again and mm-hmm. how it's how the family itself is like this entity and so you have this sort of random Lannister who for one second got to sit you know, close to the center of that family, and it became this huge hero worship. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did you think about that scene? Well, my my, what I wrote after watching the scene was that Joffrey is Jamie's true son. That <laughs> Jamie is just as much of a sociopath as his son is. He just hides it a little better, probably because he had a proper father who taught him discipline and how to hide it and how yeah. to get along. Um, but. I mean, that was just, it was awful when he kills that boy yeah. because you're, you're kind of listening to it and you, you feel like, like you're, I was taken in by it, you know, like you're taken in listening to his story the same way that boy is. And he's like thinking, oh, wow, you know, I've had a similar experience to the Kingslayer and here he is like talking to me and empathizing with me and opening up and uh-huh. sharing and we're having this, you know, camaraderie. And then at the end, you realize that Jamie didn't even know who he was like Jamie's 
first comment about I was at whoever's wedding. Like he was literally so probably so drunk that whole time. He did not remember going. He never remembered that boy. Yeah. He never remembered any of that. He just he saw an opportunity and he played him like a fucking master player. And yeah, and that's similar to what he did to um in the very at the end of the first season with the the Stark Bannerman. Mm-hmm. You know, they thought he he sort of allowed him to believe that they were sort of comrades in arms as well, and then he stabbed him in the face. Yeah, and jerk. Yeah. <laughs> it, it kind of he he's he's obviously got a pattern of behavior, which is I can he's got that charisma and he has that I guess vulnerability that he can either maybe it's real or maybe it's just assumed that he can project and it it draws people in and it makes them trust him and then he literally stabs them in the back i mean he was king slayer for a reason and they didn't give him that name because he killed the king they called him king slayer and it's derisive because he was one of the fucking king's guard he was sworn to protect the Mm -hmm. king and he got it like he walked in the door because he was part of the King's guard and he killed him. And then he opened it to the Lannisters to come in. Like it was like, that's who he is, is he takes you and then he stabs you in the back. And he has a lovely way of making it seem okay with a speech that was right out of the books. The, they make you swear and swear speech. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he, it seems like reasonable. He says it and you're like, yeah, you know what? He was just trying to uphold all the, you know, to be honorable, to, to get rid of a, a terrible King. But mm-hmm. Kat has it right, you know, when she says you have no honor. Yeah. You have to choose. Being, being a, you know, a human in this world, whether it's fantasy or not, you mm-hmm. got to choose. It, if, are you going to adhere to the rules or are you not? You can't decide that some rules work and some rules don't. And, you know, you could even make an argument for him taking that, that point of view of, well, I need to kill this king because he's cruel and he's mad. He's killing innocents and whatever. Mm-hmm. But – you kind of at this at this at the heart of that decision there has to be a solid morality that everyone can understand like if ned stark had been one of this the king's guard and he had made that choice i think everyone would have understood it and understood why and because he would have had a pattern of behavior because he would have had a pattern of behavior it. and a moral code even so and like he would have gone back to living by that moral code and he'd be like yeah that's who ned stark is and it's obvious that that's what he was going to do if it came to that point and that you know level of depravity or whatever right but with jamie he doesn't seem to have that philosophical rock he doesn't he's just sort of like whatever's best for me and that's the he justifies it by saying oh there's the world is full of contradictions and shades of gray but yet he never seems to draw a moral imperative for himself exactly he he is absolutely he's he only does what benefits himself and you, it probably has even nothing to do with what his father tells him to do. Like, I'm sure okay. the fact that his father was, you know, siding with the usurper had a lot to do with Jamie's decisions that day that he killed Aerys Targaryen. Mm-hmm. But if it was if it was there and it was opportunistic, and they say that when Ned got there, that Jamie was sitting in the in the throne. Mm-hmm. You know, he got up and he left the throne, but he was sitting there. <laughs> I think yeah. that's a lot about him. Yeah, there was no there. humility in the murder of the of a man who he swore to protect. Right. He wasn't he wasn't sitting there like crying over the fact that he had to break that oath for the sake of maybe an oath that he considered more, you know, un, more holy or however you, right. whatever terms you want to put it in. You know, there was no I guess moral conflict in him over what he had done. And the and the saddest part is yeah, you know, he did kill that Karstark um guard. Who's going to avenge him killing that poor Lannister boy? No yeah. one will ever know. And so what? It got him, it got him a, a night's worth of running around in the woods before he was recaptured, and it, it was totally useless. He didn't yeah. care because he just wanted to cause trouble. Yeah, he, well, he just he wanted to kill someone. I actually thought the, uh, the theme of this episode was how much these men love to kill things. Yes. Because <laughs> um, I feel like... I don't know that Tywin necessarily said any of that explicitly, but I felt like that was kind of an undertone in some of his uh, the scenes with him. And certainly the Hound does say it explicitly. Mm-hmm. You know, he has that moment with, with Sansa in the hallway, and he's like, she's like, no, my father didn't like to. He, he, it was just his duty. And the Hound's like, he lied. There's nothing sweeter in the world than taking someone's life. Um, and obviously I think 
you're right, Jamie did just want to cause trouble, and he did just, like, want to kill someone and get to go stretch his legs and take a shit that he wasn't going to yeah. have to sit in later. You know, yeah. take a bath, maybe. And he's like, whatever, now. And maybe, <laughs> and maybe, you know, with the end of the episode, it's kind of left ambiguous as to what happens. I mean, obviously, Kat is uncertain of her ability to keep him protected, and she, he's a prisoner that she needs alive. And right. so maybe he figured he, if he caused enough trouble, he could force her hand to either go ahead and kill him or let him go. Right. And he, I mean, the only, he, they have him because of Sansa, right? Like, mm-hmm. he, that's the negotiating piece. Well, right and, they, and they think Arya. And they because, think Arya, of course. Because Cersei keeps claiming that she has both girls, even though there's, you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Arya, mm-hmm. I love, yeah, we can go back to Tywin. That was such a great moment between the two of them, especially when he said that she reminded him of Cersei. Mm-hmm. And at the, you know, first you're like, no, I hate Cersei. Arya's awesome. Shut up. But then you're like, you know what? That makes total sense to me. Are, it's very plausible that maybe Cersei was a cool little kid and, you know, that's what happens when you, when you force someone into a role that they're not well suited for right yeah and i I feel like i feel like we haven't gotten to to hear a lot of cersei's story and kind of how she became this person and i i don't really care what her story is she's done things that are completely unjustifiable no matter what cruelties she survived Mm -hmm. but at the same time we I think they're doing they're, – they're trying very hard to humanize her this season, maybe even a little more than they did last season. And we got some, some more of that this episode, which we'll come back to. But mm-hmm. but to your point, I, I think that we are kind of starting to see that maybe she was someone who life is not treated well because of the roles that she had the chance to play. The one that she was – that was kind of forced on her was the worst of all options for her. Right. And, you well, and that, and that goes back to Jamie, her twin, saying, I would have been useless at anything else but what I am. Mm-hmm. Well, what if he had been forced to be a farmer or a rock mason or, you know, or someone's squire forever? Right. Like Cersei basically was. Because Cersei, is, she wants to be just like her brother. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't. You know, they, she got married off, and now she has to devote her life to her children. I think she says it too much that her whole she life. loves her children. Yeah, she just says it too much because people are like, oh, well, she has the mother. You know, every, I, I can pity her or I can understand because she's doing it for her kids. And I'm like, I don't think she loves her children, quite frankly. I think she wants to. I think she mm-hmm. wants to very, very much. But I don't think she has it in her. See, <laughs> I, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's that. I think that she loves her children, but. They are she monsters, hates, but, she, <laughs> but she hates her life even more. Yeah, and I well, I, certainly this episode we got her clear recognition that Joffrey is a monster, and she knows it. I, mm-hmm. I think that she does truly love her younger ones, and as Tyrion put it, you know, they're fine, loving children. You beat the odds. You got two out of three. You know, it's yeah. Just unfortunate that it's kind of the one who matters that's the one that's fucked up. Um, and Marcella has been sent away, so all she has is Tommen, and he's like four. <laughs> Right, and who knows if he's even going to survive childhood. Right, but I, I think that I think that her bitterness and her resentment of her role in her life uh, kind of take away from her love of her children. Because, like, you see examples of mothers that do everything for their children. Lisa Aaron is one. She that woman is fucked up, and she's fucking crazy, and mm-hmm. she's the worst mother in the world. But you know what? You can actually see where what she's doing is because she's trying to protect her son. Yes. You know, so she might be fucking equally as crazy as Cersei, but the way she's directing all of her anger and resentment and hatred of the world is obviously to protect her children. And Cersei, she doesn't – there are cruelties that she inflicts on other people that cannot possibly have anything to do with protecting her children that would, in fact, put her children in more danger because they make her more enemies and her children more enemies, such as saying, I want – um, Sansa's wolf dead if we can't have Arya's. Yeah. And there, there was just no reason for that, and it made an enemy out of every member of the Stark family when she chose to, to behave that way, just to make a point that she had the power to do it or that she would protect Joffrey. That wasn't protecting him. That was... That no, was that just... was Lannister arrogance. They have this exactly. need They have this need to, to be right. 
you know, to, to, to gain revenge on anyone who has wronged them for whatever reason. Right. And so that was, so she does, she does too many things that are not about her children for that argument to hold weight for me. And also I'm not, into the whole like attachment parenting thing, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's like very it, topical, <laughs> week, you know. And I, I feel like anyone who's like, oh, whatever Cersei does is justified because she does does it for love of her children. Like seriously, you need to take a good hard look at where your priorities are because you know, no, like there are things that you don't do even if it's for your kids. And yeah, that, that's just where I come down on that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you have to you have to draw the line, and the Lannisters just don't. They're very selfish, you know. Anyone who isn't a she said that to to Joffrey once. Anyone who isn't us is an enemy. Yes, and it's true. Yeah, although uh, I, I do think that she gave Sansa some pretty choice marital advice, which is basically don't love anybody but your children. Well, especially when you have no control and you're marrying a monster, yes, that's extremely yeah. good advice. Yeah. I mean, she literally like told Sansa like, I, "You can't love my son. You can try, but I, I." She, that was basically admitting that I can't actually love him. That he's my son, and I realize how horrible he is. Yeah, uh, that I uh, can I just say that I give HBO so many props for not shying away from the period scene because. You know, it's a little different in the book, but basically the same. And I thought that they were going to be like, we don't want to alienate our male audience, so we're just going to talk about it or say that it happened. They weren't going to show it. Mm -hmm. uh, but they did show it, and props to them because, you know, periods happen, and it's not any grosser than seeing somebody get his head chopped off and mm -hmm. his bowels fall out of his body. So awesome. Yeah, and – the whole, I thought it would be less messy. Yeah. No, honey, welcome, welcome to real life. <laughs> I think every girl says that. <laughs> Yet another dream shattered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every single girl sees, says that when that happens because it's like, I've, look, I've never seen anyone in the street <laughs> covered in their own blood. So it must not be that bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's like, well. <laughs> no, yeah, it was good. I, I, the whole desperation, uh, you know. So mm -hmm. she was only safe until that happened. You feel for yeah. her. Yeah. I'm kind of happy that Shay sort of stepped up and is going to be her friend. Yeah, I don't know. It showed that Shay is trustworthy. Yeah, it shows that she's trustworthy. Um, it, you know, Sansa needs friends, even if they are totally incompetent handmaidens. <laughs> yeah. So and I, I, I did think that it, that Shay kind of pussied out, like not slitting that girl. Straight. Yeah, I was like, come on, just kill her. Because, you know, she just she's goes straight down the stairs and tattle. <laughs> Yeah, and then the hound, you know. Oh, the hound. God, that was a dick move to be. Well, you know what? The hound has probably been standing in the hallway, and Shay ran out chasing that maid, and he was like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, and you know, trying to protect her. But it was kind of sweet what he told her, that that and kind of horrifying, and you don't look forward to Sansa's married life when he's like, you're going to appreciate the cruel things I do when I'm the only one standing between you and your beloved king. Yeah. And you're kind of like, you know what, that's awesome that in a way he's promising to do what he can to protect her from Joffrey. Like, that's interesting that his that he has a loyalty to her that might actually be a little bit deeper than his loyalty to Joffrey. Yeah, I, well, I think he recognizes that Joffrey is not – I mean, right. yeah, he's part of the Kingsguard, but so what? What, what is – what's a, a – an oath to a crazy ass king worth. I mean, Jamie, Jamie already told us the answer to that. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I, speaking of Jamie though, do you think it was smart of him to tell Kat that he is Joffrey's father? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I kind of feel like maybe everyone in the kingdom has accepted that that's probably true and just said, you know what? they have the money and that kid's on the throne so. <laughs> yeah i know like, but it was just, just funny to me i'm like why are you telling her that she's like a, you know she's a noble woman her word is going to be taken as law and you just told her so now she's just gonna be like he told me he told me <laughs> it's true and Brienne of Tarth was standing there as a witness. So it's yeah. not just going to be like one of Kat's crazy, you know, suspicions again, where she's like <laughs> blaming Tyrion for the knife, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, uh, poor. Oh my God. That scene between Tyrion and, and Cersei, when she's kind of crying and upset and he's just kind of like, there, there. <laughs> what do I do? Because you could tell that 
he he wanted to comfort her, but he was like, the second I do, she's going to realize she's accepting comfort from me and right. just shut down. And maybe she needs to, like, vent and cry a little bit more than she needs someone to, like, come hold her pair, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was funny, too, because I was like, he must be like, where's Lancel? I need to I need to go for Lancel. <laughs> Who's the Lannister who's paid to do this shit? Come on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, right? Yeah. That's not his job. But it actually, I actually thought it was kind of a a profound moment because it does show that as much as they hate each other at heart, they are siblings and they are true, proper Lannisters from the family, you know, as the cousin put it. And they're kind of they are kind of alone against a lot of common enemies. Yeah. I mean, Tyrion put it very well. He's like, well, father's not here, so it's you and me and Joffrey. Yes, and and no matter how much he dislikes, you know, his sister, he it's his sister, right? Mm-hmm. And, I and mean, he, that, he, but that's Tyrion, right? Because, no, we know Tyrion is the most normal character in, in the book, right? He is the one with the most human feelings and the most human emotions. So he is going to be the person who – Still gives a shit about his sister, even though she's a stupid bitch, right? Yeah. Well, well, we'll see how much longer that lasts. If she finds out about Shay and, like, has her killed off or something, I don't know if that's going to – I don't know if Tyrion's brotherly love would survive that. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I, I I can't tell you anything. Sorry. Well, that, that, that's looking ahead to the scenes from next episode bit where he's like, I will never forgive you for this. <laughs> oh, yes, and then they also showed a scene where he's like, we must be careful. People here yeah. want to hurt me. Yeah. <laughs> Beating my sister. She really wants to hurt me. <laughs> well, and then you have, you know, what Cersei said as she's watching, you know, her little girl get shipped off to Dorne. Mm-hmm. I pray that you love someone this much so that I can take her from you. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, I don't know. It, since you watched the clip in the uh, for like the next episode, the one I saw was like two episodes left, and yeah. we were all looking at each other like, "What? This is episode seven? HBO? What the hell? We're getting nine episodes this season? Fuck no, you. no, no! This is what I decided. Episode ten is just going to be George Martin sitting in a in a chair in an empty room laughing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to be yeah. that. An hour of him just being like, ha, 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 ha. Actually, it'll be a montage, because didn't, didn't we posit that at some point we're going to have an, an entire episode? It's like the, the last episode of the series is Sansa, like, sitting in an empty throne room with, like, bodies all around her, just, like, laughing hysterically, you know? Yes, yes. Like so it'll be, it'll be, like, the, la- the hysterical laughter montage of everyone who's kind of left alone and forsaken. Speaking of hysterical laughing... <laughs> about Jon Snow. Yes, we can. Fun. We can talk about Jon Snow knowing nothing. <laughs> God, okay, that that whole scene, the fact that she's like, do you know nothing, Jon Snow? I was like, that is a fucking nod to that internet meme. Like, there is no way around Well, that. it's not an internet meme. She actually says it in the book. Like, a hundred times. But the, oh, okay, well, fine. But the fact that they chose to use that line that has become a meme instead of being like no right it, because it becomes okay. this defi- it defines his character like every every other I'm and I'm exaggerating only the teeniest easiest bit every other thing she says to him is you know nothing <laughs> it's like covers the page it's like all you're reading is you know nothing you know nothing and finally he's like I do know nothing I know nothing uh, maybe I know nothing do I know something I know nothing and then everybody else is going yeah you know nothing <laughs> and it, it's just, it's like a monster, and it just it, every book has its own like tagline. Um, I think dance with words was words are wind, uh, but clash and I I would say maybe Storm of Swords, Swords as well is knowing nothing. And it, it when we were in the bar. And, you know, they kept having their little conversations and everybody was waiting for her to say it. Like everybody, you could see people were saying <laughs> it for themselves. People were like, say it, say it, say you know nothing. And finally she says it and everybody just started shrieking. <laughs> and then there were like, you know, the, the third of the people who hadn't read the book being around going, why is everybody screaming at that? She, that was just the end of the scene, you guys. <laughs> Nothing's happening. See, I actually, I actually thought that that got said to him a couple times in the first book, too. So it's just sort of like this repeated thing about his character. Uh-huh. And that could easily be wrong. Because, but I, I saw enough of the, uh, the like, emo Jon Snow posts and things like that <laughs> from last season to, to see, like, everyone doing the Jon Snow, you know nothing. And so I, I he, doesn't, he doesn't know shit, okay? He doesn't yeah. know shit. 
Well, he he is this. He he thinks he's worldly, and he really is not. Like <laughs> well, he's, he's worldly in a hypothetical way. Like I think he he's. I mean, he's a bastard. He he grew up with you know like learning the responsibilities of being a lord with his brother, but knowing that he was a product of his father's, you know. Right, and that of, he had no rights to any of it. And, and he that. had no rights to it. And yeah, so he's kind of in this weird thing where like intellectually he has all this knowledge, but he has no life experience. Right, exactly. He And he wasn't taught that life experience in the same way that Rob was because he didn't need. Right. Everybody always knew that he would go to the wall because that's just the only only place he could go he couldn't stay at winterfell well there was there's a maybe possibility that he could become like rob's master of arms or something like that if you know maybe maybe soon enough and like you know rob was like catlin you have to mom just get the fuck out of the way he's he's staying he's my brother yeah maybe except that that doesn't give bran a lot to do yeah that's true Uh, yeah you know bran and rickon they're gonna get whatever the openings are first yeah that's that's a good point uh, but yeah, he does know nothing, and I, I'm sorry, Igret is the best character ever. She, <laughs> she just says all the things to him that you want to say to him. It's just, it's just marvelous. I love that she exists. It's, it, it is marvelously freeing to see a character who kind of just like goes around and speaks truth, and you know, yeah, and doesn't give a shit. And the fact that he thinks that he can like blackmail her or bully her or just ask her nicely, it's like you have her tied up. With mm-hmm. a rope, you're dragging her to her certain death because what are you going to do when you get back to the rest of the Night's Watch? They're just going to be like, oh, yeah, we'll just – We'll, we'll kill her since up. you obviously can't. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you really think that she's going to be all compliant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, like, I, I, don't, I don't know what he expected, but – No, I, no, I don't – he doesn't know a damn thing. <laughs> Yeah, but just in the way he and, and he doesn't understand like every time he tells her to shut up, like it makes it worse. Like yes. it's just like, dude, I I guess you didn't have like the Arya hero worshipped you, so you didn't have the annoying and, and like Sansa ignored you. You didn't have the annoying little sister who pulls the whole I'm going to like poke at the thing that you react to and like if you react to anything then I'm just going to like poke and poke and poke and poke and poke and poke. <laughs> Hi was that sister. Like some days I I mean I already worshipped, you know, like my brother, but other days I like I was the worst little twat ever and he, you know, told me on many occasions if you were a brother you would be dead by now. <laughs> you know, so I was in some ways the recipient of like boys don't hit girls as hard. He hit me plenty, you know, but like, that's just, John didn't have that. No, he has no idea what to do. He's never had yeah. to deal with a woman that wasn't related to him. Or, you know, or obviously a whore who was so, like, unimpressed what? by the bastard of Winterfell that she was like, whatever, take your money back. I'm not going to try. Yeah, right? Like, he, he, him, he couldn't even have sex with Roz. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's just, yeah, no, I love it. I love it. And, and now that he's captured, um... It, his storyline just gets so much more interesting because he's not going to be sitting around alone. Like, I feel like they yeah. stretched out him and Egret for two episodes. Like, uh, come on, guys. Like, two episodes of them talking to each other in the in the snow. It's like, it looks really pretty, but can we have some plot movement? Cause... Well, we just, it was, there, that, that was there for comic relief because those the, the two episodes, every time the two of them came up, I was, like, cracking up. Like, yeah. before anything even happened. It was just – and it was nice to have that kind of break from the relentless terror of, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? Yeah, yeah that's you know? true. Uh, and, <laughs> and it is kind of nice to, to have – the the sense that for this one character even things going horribly wrong is actually probably something in his life going right because i'm sorry being brought to the wall at 17 years old when you're john fucking snow and yeah, it's a way you did you did grow up as like rob's brother and you, you want those things and you have these secret dreams that maybe my mom wasn't like a street camp whore but you know a lady <laughs> in a tower and you know, all these like things like it's a shitty life and (laughs) so he's being forced away from that and yeah there's going to be this like conflict with his honor but he has to be forced away from that but it's going to be a good thing for him i'm so yeah i'm sorry conflicted honor is so sexy come on (laughs) (laughs) it reminds me do you you, you've read the kushiel books right where she has the 
the monk not. that like hangs out with her and she's like this like, super sexy courtesan who like gets off of bondage and they're it's a fantasy book series but i know the, i know the series I've, i i know the back what the what the front of the book looks like with like it's always the back with the tattoo yeah. yeah uh anyway she has this companion who has like sworn to never touch a woman and very you know very similar to that and he's like a monk and he, he's very spirited and devout and like you spend like the whole book just being like just bone already <laughs> That's how I feel about Jon Snow and Ygritte. <laughs> well, can, can we talk about what's what's his name? Maze Rancer or whatever the king beyond the wall has styled himself. Mance Raider. Mance Raider. Yeah. Can we talk about how I am like thoroughly convinced that's Uncle Benji under that mask? You think? I what think. Makes, what makes you think think this thing? A couple things. Okay. First of all. <laughs> How many of the Black brothers were actually kind of badass enough leaders and warriors to go into the wildling camps and convince them to follow them? Like, Uncle Benji was one of their best raiders. He was all the time going beyond the wall for, like, you know, weeks and months at a time. No Mm -hmm. one knew where he went. He's Ned Stark's brother. And you know that, like any good Winterfell man, he's got ambition. He's hard. He's of the North. He can impress, like, wildlings. He was raised to that kind of mentality. But – well, let me finish. Okay, all right. And when we met him in the preview for next episode, he had a mask on. There's no reason. That was not. That was that was not Mance Raider. That was not Mance Raider. Okay. Guy in the mask is not Mance Raider. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying. So yes. I was going to say, there's no reason for him to be in a mask unless he's a character we've already met that they don't want to reveal yet. Uh, but yeah. okay, if that's not who that was, then but was your a... your theory is still is still got uh, water. That's... But that's still, like, my theory because I I just think that the the pieces of information we have fit, and I think that that's a good – I could see Uncle Benji having that kind of ambition. Right, and we know that it was a former crow. Mm -hmm. Um, And that Uncle Benji's missing. And that he's missing and no one can find him. Um, Yeah, no, yeah, that's definitely definitely plausible. Uh, To be a devil's advocate, just to throw a stone in, uh, we do know that he's also a Stark. Um, well, that's, that's the only argument against it, that a Stark wouldn't forsake his vows. To, but maybe he would. If he, if we don't he really found, know, we don't know Benjen that well, so. We, we don't know, well, we don't know Benjen that well, but, but also, just going back to, to our earlier point about Jamie and having conflicting vows, mm-hmm. maybe, I mean, it's also possible that Benjen Stark actually saw... Uh, he might. It's like I might have to break my vow to the Brotherhood, but it's for the deeper vow of protecting Westeros, protecting the realm. Yeah, that and maybe be... he thinks that he could actually better serve them by becoming this like leader of the Wildlings and getting them somewhat under control, you know, than he would by. Yeah, definitely you know. plausible. So, I mean, if you if you want to talk about somebody who breaks a vow, but for kind of a, a deeper, consistent reason, I think it would be as as we said, it would be a Stark, and so. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm, I'm not – look, I'm, every time I throw out a theory, I figure it's, like, mm, 2% hey, you have, I mean, I'm, happens, but <laughs> – Yeah, like, you, I think you've been, like, 50% right, 50% wrong so far in this whole – in this whole watch of things that you said – that you predict, so. Yeah, but that, but that was where I thought that was going to culminate. It made narrative sense to me that that's Uncle Benji. So. Yeah. No, yeah, totally, totally. I can see I can see why, why you think these things. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. What? 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 <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. I'm. I'm definitely just gonna go down. Uh, I, I'm excited to to meet Mance Raider. I'm excited to meet some other characters. Uh, I, there were some sort of casual mention on Tywin's part of the Brotherhood without banners that made me kind of like happy. Uh. People keep bringing up Barristan Selmy so that we don't forget the badassness of him. You know, I, I, it's good to pay attention. I feel like that there are finally, because we're so far along now that the, all the characters are established, that they're mm-hmm. able to start layering in more things, like yeah. casually mentioned names or characters in the background or, like, whatever. Uh, and that's important because I feel like we're coming up to – what Pyat Pri is demanding that uh, Danny do is come to the House of the Undying. Mm-hmm. 
uh, you know, so stuff's going to start getting more complicated, and we have Quaith hanging out, and we know that she all she does is spout prophecy. Yeah, like, why Why the fuck was she was she the person that Sarah Jorah ran to? Like, <laughs> that was just weird. But, and, yeah, uh, I, I'm glad that you're being an attentive viewer. <laughs> that you're paying attention to shit. Because it would suck if you were just like, la, 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 that was good, I liked that. And then I'm sitting here going, oh, my God, you didn't notice me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty that I am failing to notice. But I, I have demanded that, you know, my husband stop uh, fast-forwarding through the previously. I'm like, no, 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 they change it every time, and it's always pertinent. Please stop doing that. <laughs> I want to be reminded of what just happened that we need to remember for this episode. <laughs> No, it's helpful. It's so helpful. Yeah, it is. And, and I think they do a great job of kind of blowing through, like, what are the kind of moments that you need to have that are callbacks, you know. Right. And, Especially um, because the show, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that kind of look the same because, mm-hmm. you know, everybody's dirty. And There was some joke that I saw online today where they were like, England is running out of scruffy looking men to wander around the, <laughs> to wander around the backgrounds and the scenes of game of thrones which is kind of true it's like oh god every time somebody gets like a new sidekick or a new helper it's like do i know who that guy is he's just kind of Mm -hmm. like a a gross seedy you know guy yeah or even like not the gross seedy ones as you pointed out random lannister cousin looked a little bit like gendry he does look he looked just like gendry and that whole scene was so frustrating because i mean i knew it was gonna you know that it was not going to work out well for him but he just kept like scooting closer and closer and closer to jamie but then like when the camera would reset he wouldn't be any closer at all mm-hmm. it's just like i was like come on fake gendry just get there jamie's been talking for a half hour it's just like... <laughs> well he had to be subtle i mean he had that guard walking by with the arrested development no touching no touching <laughs> you know you gotta you gotta like not upset the guard there right 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 well, I think the one thing that we have forgotten to talk about is the Robin to Lisa moment yes. <laughs> where he randomly was like, you know what, just come with me. And she got that look on her face and she's like, I don't want to go. The, the look on the face that you should have seen was the look on Roos Bolton's face. <laughs> that look, I was just like, I'm with you, Roos. I am with you. Because he's like, oh, excuse me. I'll let you talk to this stupid whore. You dumbass. I'm just going to be over here talking about tactics and important shit because we're fighting a war. But you flirt with the dirty nurse. It's cool. I'll just be over here (laughs) writing a letter to my bastard at the Dreadfort. (laughs) Yeah, well, I have a feeling that we're going to find out who Lady Talisa is next episode. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I have have such a feeling myself. Because Uh, I... I feel like she wouldn't have been at all hesitant to go if she was like, there's going to be someone there who knows me, and they could blow my cover. Yeah, she's like, oh, you want me to go with you? Okay. But why? But And he's you, like, is I, there I, another I, woman going with him, like his mother? No, his mother got left behind. That is <laughs> not. Yeah, Rob was totally hoping for, like, some campfire nookie. Although, if he's oh, supposed yeah. to be, like, back in the morning, maybe they're just, like, riding through the night, so that's not actually going to be very sexy. I don't know. Are they on one horse? <laughs> I know, right? I guess they are. Maybe they're on one horse. <laughs> and, oh She'll God. be riding his saddle bone. <laughs> I was going to say, can we go back to Igret's, um <laughs> slang for cock and balls? <laughs> Stop, that. Call it that. Stop calling it. What? Stones? He's like, both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, God. I'm like, yeah, he is just like this prim, pretty. I mean, comparatively, he can't, probably he can't super say pretty. the words without blushing. <laughs> I can teach you how. He's like, what? Right here in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I will give him that. That was a good comeback, you know. She's like, but it's wet. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Agret. I yeah. love her. I love her to death. Well, is, is there anything with the, with Arya that we need to talk about? Actually, I want to talk about this because you had the best way of, of putting it. Arya is digging a hole called, I am clearly being held by Tywin for possible ransom later if he figures out who I belong to and that the family I belong to is causing him trouble. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, Arya 
she might be too smart for her own good and that she can like cover her tracks with a slightly plausible lie except mm-hmm. for the fact that there is no fucking way any stonemason ever like was that well read and had a, a wife who was that well spoken or who taught his daughter all of those things and right. Like, and as you very aptly pointed out, just the way she holds herself, like, she makes eye contact with Tywin fucking Lannister. Mm-hmm. Like, servants do not do that. And had she been born into the servant class, she would know better. And that's some, just one thing that Martin's brilliant at is showing characters, like, just point of view on the world through every behavior and statement that they make. Like, she doesn't even understand what she's giving away about herself by having that conversation with him and, like, arguing with him, holding her own in an argument with him. Yeah, he knows she's somebody. He's just trying to figure out who. Exactly. So, obviously, Littlefinger didn't spill those beans. Yeah, clearly. Was that because of sentimentality for Catelyn, or was it to just hold one one card close to his chest that he has over Tywin? That, or I I wouldn't put it past uh, Littlefinger to just, to actually be able to take a, a me- like a memory and just like trash it, just be like you know what that screws up my plan, so I'm just never gonna remember that I know this. Yeah, or that that he 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 seems like the type who could do that too. Uh, yeah, but it, it is pretty funny that he's coming ever closer to sort of figuring out who she is, mm-hmm. and hilarious that he thinks that that was an assassination attempt on him. <laughs> It, it, it was. I mean, totally, like, totally makes sense, but because we know what we know, it's just funny because she doesn't really give a shit about him right now. Exactly. Although I did wonder is the fact that Ari is hearing his talk about, you know, we hanged 20 men. We'll hang 100 if you have to and, like, burning villages. Like, is she actually taking that onto her conscience is like, oh, wait, like, the fact that I demanded Jock and Hagar kill that guy, like, made this happen. Like, all these people are dying because of me. Like, I didn't get the feeling that she necessarily made that connection, and I kind of hope she doesn't, because I don't want her to become, like, totally destroyed by the guilt of what she's done or something. Yeah, I don't feel like Arya has – I mean, I, I think that she could intellectually say, yes, he is killing people because of what I asked Jockin to do, but mm-hmm. I think she would also be able to say, but he's a bad man, and yes. that isn't my fault that he's a bad yeah. person. Or the whole, but it was necessary for my survival, and so I'm going to make that choice every time, and there's no use, like, beating myself up about it. Yeah, she's very pragmatic. Like, she's just just trying to survive. She's trying to get back to her brother. And and while she's there, she's learning as much as she can. That's the only plausible reason for not asking Jockin to kill Tywin. Right. You know, because he lets her stand in the room while he talks about every single thing that he's going to do. Yeah, well, and I think I think I will give Arya this. I mean, for a kid, she is basically concerning herself with the people that have done a direct harm to her. Tywin Lannister has not directly harmed her. It no, but but right? can I just point this out? You don't think that he was absolutely testing her when she brought him that food in the wake of an assassination attempt on himself, and he knows that she's some northern lady. Oh, and I, absolutely. He, I, I didn't necessarily take it as a test of her. I thought he was just like, yeah, I'm going to let my page eat this because I, I'm not eating until this is solved, you know. Right. That and also I think he might have – if he's smart, he'll be like, this is a girl who might be helping at least to kill me. Good so point. why don't you eat that dinner right there and let's see what happens. Mm-hmm. And he, like, kept her there just long enough that she would have died if, you know, or gotten sick if it was – and they're just like, okay, you're, it's clean, so go to the kitchen, get the fuck out of here. I don't want to watch you eat. <laughs> yeah, like, you eat as much as you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually I, – I didn't I did not think of it in terms of him, like, testing Arya herself. I, th- I thought it was more he just was being overly cautious, and he gave it to his page because he didn't – like want to eat it because right. and, he, and he was curious to see if it was poisoned didn't occur to me that he thought she might have poisoned it i mean That's it could have been i could be either way obviously she he, i mean if i was Tywin and i knew even if he knew who she was he doesn't she doesn't have resources at least not that mm-hmm. he knows of so mm-hmm. it's not like she would actually be the instigator of any assassination attempt but right but she would probably be being a northern Right. A girl from a northern house. He's you're you're right to point out that he's like yeah she'd be totally willing to do it if someone's like dump this in his dinner Right. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
but yeah, I, I, I love that, that, and especially when she's like imagining shoving her fork into his neck while he's just mm-hmm. blibbering on, and she's like, I don't care. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Look at that vein pulsing. You can, you can see her like playing it out like the, like in the new Sherlock Holmes movies where he's like, okay, now I'm going to like swing with this like force with my right hook, and then at the uh-huh. you know, next second with an upper jab on my left, and his you know, it'll snap his jaw and, like, knock his brain into the side of his head, and then his, you know, eyes are going to cross, and his nose smashes, <laughs> and he's done. Like, you can see her trying to calculate that, but she's just not sure enough about her skills. Although, I think that she is a little arrogant at this point, because she can't just yeah. command Jockin to kill people, and he does it. Mm-hmm. And Tywin hasn't killed her yet, even though she's been, you know, kind of lippy to him. Yeah, and she did kill that boy that was going to turn her in with needles. So, she's, like, she's got blood on her hands at this Definitely. point. Definitely. And then, so it's time, I think it's time for Arya to start being a little bit more careful. Circumspect. That's the word. She needs to take yeah. a, a, a lesson from Locke Lamora. You have no circumspection. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, hopefully um, we have three more episodes left and not two. But HBO, yeah. you know, they, they rewrite the rules. So. <laughs> I will be, I, I can have this ad if it's two, but, you know. I was I, like, I, what the hell are they talking about? Two episodes left till the finale. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I, w- I would rather it be, like, nine really tight episodes than ten shitty ones. But still, I would rather it be ten episodes. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's not going to be, there's no way that the next three episodes are going to be shitty. Don't worry. Oh, no, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, if, if, if the difference, if, like, the one episode difference is going to be, like, awesome versus, like, shitty, um, I'd rather have the less and the good, but I would rather have 10 episodes because I think it, 10 would be good, and <laughs> I'm not ready for it to be done yet. For yeah, years. I know. It's so good. It's kind of, like, mind-boggling. I'm like, oh, they're they're going to – all right, they're tying it up in the next three episodes. Okay. <laughs> and then I'm like, God, am, at this point, am I going to be able to resist the siren lure of the books? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> well, if you do get through, um, the third book is the best. So you, I think what's, you'll, you'll eat that up and – and then you'll get to feast, and then you'll stab yourself in the face. Yeah. Well, see, I don't. You know, the thing, the, the the truth of my life is, I don't have the reading time to read these books. So, as much as I make that joke, like the fact is, I'm not going to go read them. Like, yeah, unfortunately, I I'm trapped on a steel tube underground for two hours a day. So. Yeah. I'm all yeah. Kidding. <laughs> I don't have that. I drive to work, and so my reading time is my 30 minute lunch <laughs> right, right uh well the shows i honestly i'm still on on team show I'm still liking it i'm not forsaking it i'm not one of those angry people who are really mad at the changes so hopefully when i say that the show is just as good as reading the books people won't send me hate mail <laughs> Well, ho- hopefully it just continues to be as good as the books, just different. And then it's, as you pointed out, it's just, it's new canon to, to know and love and enjoy. And you don't, you can enjoy not knowing again, which, right? you know, just, there's a certain pleasure in, in experiencing a story for the first time. Yeah. And especially with characters that you know and love already, to see them mm-hmm. in a new way, mm-hmm. not necessarily like totally like not knowing what's going to happen, but at least to see it from a different angle. That's that's refreshing. It's nice. It's an it's a way to to go back and enjoy it once again. Mhm. So, we'll see. Well, I guess uh, we'll look forward to next week. Yep. Yay. <laughs> That wraps us up for this episode. Thanks for listening. Come back next week and always remember to ask more wine, sir. Shh.